Hello, everybody. Welcome to Irresistible, our drawing together episode today. Welcome, everybody. I see everybody coming in. I've got the chat up on my left, so that's where I'm looking at right now. Love the wordplay, everybody. Um, so this is fantastic. People joining in from all over the place. Florida, Jersey, Tucson. Sounds like it's pretty hot there in Texas. All right, so today we are going to be working with this subject. Of course, it's the ear. This, I'm just going to say ears are weird. Um, and I think they're really valuable to draw, especially if you're a portrait artist. Um, this is a, an area where I feel um, students will often struggle. We put so much emphasis on the eyes, the nose, the mouth, getting that likeness. And then we get to the ears and we're like, what do we do with this thing? It's just a, it's kind of a weird lump on the side of our head. So we're going to try to make sense of that today. Um, this is the paper I'm working with. It's a Hanamula paper. It's nice and smooth. I'm going to be working with graphite today, and I really like that combination together. Um, so this one is, is really going to be a lot about subtlety and form. Um, so this is a, a wonderful form just to practice with. Um, as an object, an ear gives us a lot to really kind of sink our teeth into. One of the things is that, you know, is the edge control. We're going to be paying attention to this along the outer edge. Um, we have these shifts in um, edges within the ear, and so we're going to really kind of try to understand uh, the form and how to use line versus value, when to use that. Um, we have light reflecting on a concave surface as well as a convex surface. So again, there's a lot for us to really dig into today. So um, if you have any questions, feel free to call them out in all caps here. Um, I'm going to be monitoring the thread. I'm going to try to get to everybody um, hello, hello. I'm um, just going to look. I see a lot of familiar names here. This is fantastic. I like the wordplay, everybody, as well. So I think that's one of the, the most fun aspects of this, this whole series is coming up with the titles. So if you have any ideas, just let me know. Wednesday, we're going to be doing um, Orange You Excited, Orange You Glad. What is it? Orange You Something, Orange You Excited, I believe. Um, so that'll be on Wednesday. So we're going to dig right into it. Uh, I've got the reference up on the left, and I'm going to be using both kind of the screen in front of me as well as this reference image. Um, as with the reference image, I don't quite get the the, the nice contrast, the rich darks, the brighter highlights. Um, so I found that working from a digital projection, a screen or something, um, can often be a bit more effective. Um, so I'm going to be kind of utilizing both of them. And the first thing I want to do is just to start lay out. The basic form. I'm using a 4B pencil. Um, I, I I originally, you know, I was thinking about using uh, the HB pencil that I used for the last one as well. But I'm just going to go right for this 4B, and then I'm going to bring in this. Um, this is a carbon pencil, that I'm gonna, and I'm going to bring in for some of the darker areas to try to increase that contrast. In part because the when I with the with a pair drawing on Friday, it uh, it didn't quite give the the contrast that I think is um, is kind of helpful for video. You know, we talked a lot about that, really embracing the silvery quality of the graphite. So we're going to be doing that with this as well, but we're going to try to increase the contrast a little bit by just going straight to some of the darker values. So I'm using a 4B, and I'm going to use that carbon pencil. Now, carbon pencil is kind of a, a blend of charcoal and graphite. Uh, one of the th what I want to do is to help kind of keep me on track is I'm looking for the central axis. Um, if I can imagine a, a central axis of an ear, which is kind of a challenge because it's, it's such an asymmetrical form, but there's this general line here that I can utilize. So if I go from the lower point in the lower right to the high point in the upper left, I can get this, this general line. And I think that's going to be helpful in providing a, an early orientation point. And I can kind of just keep that fairly loose. Uh, I'm just letting the the weight of the pencil do the work for me. All right, just checking the chats real quick. All right, I'm just going to keep going. All right. Again, shout out if you have any questions. Uh, and, and this is, like I said, the, the ear is a bit of a weird, a weird form. Um, I'm sure there's some wordplay we can use utilizing there, but um, thinking about the overall curve, 
I, I want to think about the basic structure. If I've got the, 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 the axis here, I want to break down that curve into short, straight sides. That's something that we've, we've dealt with a lot um, in this series, is that idea of kind of tackling the curve by breaking it down into a sequence of short, kind of diagonal marks, um, and looking for landmarks. And you may have a different set of landmarks than, than I do. Um, you know, so I, I'm seeing this point over here, which is the farthest left point of the ear. I think that's going to be a landmark. The high point on the ear is going to be a landmark. This part in here um, where we transition into that hairline is going to be one. As I come down here, um, I'm going to uh, try to locate the, uh, you know, we've got the earlobe underneath and I don't even know what this little bump is called, but um, that's going to be a landmark for me. I've got this kind of kidney shape um, and I'm just going to start to rough it in. Nothing is concrete at this point. We all, we're going to always be making adjustments, but I want to start to think about uh, some of those elements. And I want to be really careful about establishing lines on the inside here, because as you look at the, at the photograph, there really are no hard lines. I think the hardest part is going to be right in here, this diagonal kind of fold here that tucks in underneath this portion of the, the ear. So I just want to start to rough that in. Um, and get a handle on the basic proportions. And what's kind of fascinating about ears is, is how varied they are. You know, if you're a portrait artist, um, you know, everybody's ears, and they're, they're, again, they're kind of weird forms, but they, um, they're really kind of unique to the individual. And, and we often deprioritize them, but this can be something that, that really pulls it all together. We, we tend to lose steam, and often you'll see a portrait painting or a portrait drawing where the ears are just kind of just gone. They're just a, a few little suggestions, um, and that can, that can work for some artists, but it may also be an opportunity that you're missing. So what I want to do here is if I've got the, high point, the low point here, the high point here, I want to look for that, that, that central line here. If I divide that in half, maybe it's right around in here. If that's the halfway mark, I want to find that on my reference photo. And, and I can indicate that right in here. Um, and that can be helpful in orienting my, myself. So I think this, like this line needs to come down a little bit. Look at some of the negative space. And I want to keep these light and loose. This is all about just thinking right now because all of these lines are going to get kind of washed out as I, it's kind of typical of my process, which is to kind of build up some line, wash it down, um, then lay it down again, wash it out a bit. And I want to look at some landmarks here. So we have this curve and I want to see where it is relative to this landmark and it's a little bit below. And if you're working from life, these are all tools that you can utilize with the subject in front of you. All right. So I, th I feel like I'm, I'm placing the ear effectively. I've got a, 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 a basic understanding of the proportions. And I want to start to just build up some value, in particular in the area around it. So I'm just utilizing the side of the pencil. And again, as, as one of the things I've mentioned a lot, of, a lot in, the, in previous drawings is you know, as you're building up value, if you utilize the side of your pencil, it maintains a sharpness at the point, so you can use that detail when you need it. And you can really build up a lot more value very quickly if you tip it on its side. It's just a much wider surface. It also prevents you from making permanent marks early on because the, these marks kind of float on the surface more easily. This is a woodless pencil that I'm using that helps expose more of that lead. If you're using one with a wood casing, you might be challenged by that, so try to shave off a bit of the wood if you can. And then I can start to think through some of the basic shadow structure here. Just kind of blocking it in, doing a lot of squinting. And 
there's a little bit of reflected light on the inside of the earth in that concave portion. I want to try to ignore that for now. I'm going to, I'm going to, as I squint, it starts to disappear and I see the shadow within the ear a bit more effectively. I'm going to pull out the highlight here. So this is a lot about just getting rid of the white of the page. And this, this contour along here is going to be a lot of fun. I'm going to try to play with some variety. If you think back to the pear drawing, um, we talked a lot about paying attention to that contour edge, utilizing line in some places, but looking at an alternating sequence of light and dark as it relates to that background. So the, the ear might be lighter in, than the background in some areas, darker in other areas. So again, just building up value. Trying to blend using the side of my hand rather than the, the oily fingertips. So right now, it doesn't look like a whole lot, but you can start to see the basic shape. And then in from this, I can compare it to the, the shape of the, the ear in the reference photo, and I can start to adjust and correct and reestablish. That's, that mark right there made, had no real reference to what I was looking at. I was completely wrong, but... So much of drawing is about expanding your awareness of where you're working on to other areas in the, in the, in the drawing. You're thinking about the whole as well as the, the individual part. Yeah, Bonnie, uh, I see your comment there about uh, working a little bit darker. We're going to get to that kind of a darker sketch uh, more, uh, pretty quickly here. It's going to show up more, more easily soon. Um, and I might be able to actually adjust this. Let me see if I can. Maybe that shows up a little bit. Yeah, maybe that's better. Just adjusting the exposure on the camera a little bit. So it's a little bit darker than what I'm seeing here, but hopefully it shows that line. It's hard, one of the hard parts about working with, with graphite um, is dealing with that value. All right. So now what I want to do is I'm going to, this is a lot of this is negative drawing. So when I talk about negative drawing, it's about utilizing the, the, the space behind the object to create the, uh, create the form. And I may actually feel like I've cut in too much here in the ear. So what I want to do is start to draw with a kneaded eraser. And get this basic form down. Usually you bring that, that eraser in a little bit later, but I feel like it's, it's going to be helpful. So now I'm using this kind of landmark here. There's a, there's a turn here right on the, the left side. And as I carry across, I can relate that to uh, this, this landmark here. Um, and it's pretty much in line. The intersection point is right in line with these, these two points here. So I can use that to help guide my drawing. Start to block in that landmark. I may come around here. Making sure everything kind of fits together properly. So I'm looking at some of the highlights now and erasing them out. And they're going to get lost again. As I work on this, it's all going to get lost. But this is helping to ensure that I have the correct proportions overall. So as I'm, as I'm working on that background here, I'm starting to think about the direction of my marks, even though we lose a lot of them. Um, if I, with this being largely vertical and has a slight angle to it, if I run these marks horizontally or diagonally, and that's going to help to, to create a separation of those two forms and really bring that forward. I want to be careful of running marks that kind of halo around the ear, if that makes sense. Uh, one of the things I'm going to be addressing 
in the series shortly is hair, how to draw hair. Um, and so we'll get into that. So I, I'm, I may touch on that a little bit in this as, as we need to, but I want the focal point to really be the ear. Um, so as I'm working on the negative space, I'm trying to be a bit more precise now than perhaps uh, earlier. And trying to refine that form a bit more. All right, is this showing up all right? I'm seeing some comments about the exposure. It's showing, is it showing up a little bit better for you? It seems to be appearing uh, on the screen that I've got in front of me, I can see it um, quite easily, but I don't know if that's, there's a difference in the, uh, in, in the screens here, so. So what I might do actually now is shift to this, this carbon pencil, so I can get these darks in here a little bit more. It doesn't get super dark, but it gets darker. Uh, and I'm going to try to refine that edge. So if I'm happy with the overall proportions, I've got the low point, the high point, I've got the basic width, and I've got some suggestions of what's happening in, internally, I'm going to work around with the contour here and then move in inward to the rest of the drawing here. So um, I'm going to, I can go pretty dark here. Let me see how dark I can actually get with, with the pencil. I want to be kind of careful with that edge. So as I'm laying down the line, I'm trying to think about letting that line disappear. So as I come across, trying to refine these curves a little bit. And I just want to be really careful not to create a halo. That can really flatten out a drawing. So as I come right up to the edge, I want to make sure I go over it completely. And if anything, I want to cross over that line because I can always erase it back down and kind of cut that back out. If I'm too tentative right up around that edge, it creates this light halo that really breaks down that form. And so you just want to be careful with that. And like I said, if anything, you want to cross right over the edge. If you feel like you're not quite able to control um, your marks as you as you get up to that edge. Go right over it and then use your eraser to cut back the cut the form back out. All right, seems to be getting better. All right. So I'm gonna kind of suggest form. I mean, if anything, then the, these hatch marks start to reference the hair a little bit. I'm not gonna spend too much time worrying about the hair. Just kind of softening this out, building up value. So I wanna, I wanna preserve the highlights. I want some of these bright areas to really be the whitest white. So I'm not worried about kind of building up a haze on the drawing. Kind of feather that out. All right, I want to figure out, I really want to think about this edge and how I want to address it. Um, it, it because I, I may kind of vary from the, from the reference photo a bit, almost kind of isolate the, the ear and kind of play around with a, a, a variation or gradation of value on that background. So here again, as I'm building up that background, I'm going right over the edge of the ear. Because then I can cut back in, I can come back in with my kneaded eraser. Erase out the form. If I need more, I can use the rubber eraser. And then what I want to do, actually, I want to bring the ear forward a little bit here. So I might, might let this stay as a relatively light value. You can see I kind of created this, this gradation as we come down. 
And so I may create this alternating sequence where now artificially make the ear a bit darker than the background here. And as we come up, we have this highlight that's going to be bright against that darker background. So we'll have this alternating sequence of dark to light versus light to dark up here. And I'm thinking that's going to help make that ear really pop and understand the form a bit better. If I'm crossing my head into the shot, um, just let me know. I'm going to try to, try to keep an eye on it. Um, something that I've struggled with in the past. And, and definitely with, with something like this, I, I, my instinct is to get right up in there. Build up some of the, the values here. Maybe switch to my my graphite. Now, so I move back from the from the uh, the carbon pencil to this 4B pencil. And then in here, so we can create this kind of transition from dark to light, and then maybe get a little bit dark back in here again to create some contrast in the light down there. I'm gonna like that, that shift, and that, that shift in value. So make this darker as we come across. So just utilizing the side of my pencil to create these shapes. I don't want lines to be too heavy at this stage. And kind of feathering it out as I get up to the edge of the shape. All right, so that's feeling pretty good. Let's see. And maybe even Bring this out a little bit more, kind of pop that edge. Using a line there. So I just want to be selective with the line. If you are going to bring in line to define the edge, you just want to be careful not to do it too heavily because then we really use the form. So one of the things you want to be aware of with the ear, and one of the, one of the challenging aspects to in the portrait is that is determining the angle that at which it's projecting off of the side of the head. And that can be a real challenge. And you know, some ears come out more, some are more flat, some kind of round over, some of them twist and turn. So pay attention to the subject that you're working with and try to, to really understand how, how that structure works. Um, you know, so my ear here, this is my ear that I'm working on and it, it stays relatively flat against there, but there's still some form and there are aspects to it that kind of project more than others. All right, so I'm feeling a bit better about this, using the palm to smooth things out a little bit. All right, shout out if you have any questions. Everybody else following along? Who else is following along as we do this? I've seen some people um, on, on Instagram have uh, completed drawings and then tagged me in it. Um, so you can find me on Instagram, Scott L. Meyer. Um, and so I've been able to see some of the work that uh, some of you all, some all, you all have done. I don't know if anybody is joining from classes again. Was it the Sarasota Military Academy, Milburn High School? Anybody? Um, all right, let's see. I think at this point, I'm gonna come back to this section, but I feel like I, at this point now, I can start to um, add some more specificity to the form here. So I wanna take kind of a visual, visual measurement of this edge along in here and really pay attention to the idea that what I'm noticing here is that it's, um, it's not a perfect, uh, they're not perfectly parallel, the, the inner and the outer edges. And so I want to be careful not to, uh, you know, follow the instinct, which is to kind of create this line that follows perfectly parallel with this outer edge. And I want, and I want to keep these lines light because what defines this edge isn't a hard line. It's the fact that this is a shadow in this side. So as I lay down these marks and I can bring the shadow out and underneath it. And then as we come across, that line starts to soften and we have the shadow continuing on down in here. All 
All right, Betty's following along. So a shout out if you've, if you've reached a, por a part that you're kind of struggling with or it's not quite clear. All right, I think actually I want to just keep building up value. Uh, I feel like I'm being thrown off by the white of the page too much. And if anything, I want to I want to bring everything down in value. So I'm going to let this all build up. You can see all those highlights that I established are are pretty much gone. I can still see the faint ghost of them as as they were. So, um, and what you're going to see me do is at this point, I'm kind of going back to this part to kind of um, to kind of regroup. It there's you know so what you'll see me do throughout this process is coming into a certain area, focusing on it. Um, but it gets a little exhausting, and it's almost like I need to kind of focus, step back, take a breath, and, and while I'm kind of taking that breath and um, decompressing a little bit, I can work in this area, which requires a little less thought. This is all about just kind of building up that value. Uh, and then I can come back into this section here, back to where I was, and I'm a little bit more focused. Um, and that's a really a large part of the drawing process, is understanding the relationship between um, the drawing and our attention, our ability to focus. And this is an interesting play between concave and convex forms, something that is really helpful in, in all painting and drawing, especially when you're trying to define spatial relationships. When I refer to spatial relationships, I'm talking about where one object is um, in space relative to another object. Um, and the play between a concave and a convex curve helps to create that impression. You know, we're working on a two-dimensional surface, but we're trying to create the illusion of three dimensions. And there, there are a few tools that we use. There's, um, there's overlapping of form, which we're talking about here. There's scale that you can use. Um, uh, something that is more rectangular, we can use linear perspective. Um, but with abstract and kind of organic forms like this, one of the things that becomes really helpful is an awareness of the concave and convex form. So what I mean by that is I look at this curve here and it pushes in this direction and there's, there's, this, general, there's this general curve that comes down this way and that follows a general path. But as you start to break that down, once you have an idea of what that general path is, you realize that it, the curve pushes up this way and then as we come down, it starts to shift, and now this pushes in this way. And then we come back to a curve that pushes in this way, and then down. And so there's this, again, there's this general arc, and then there's a, that specific curve. And seeing how it shifts from concave to convex can really bring an object to life. Uh, when we start getting into hands, that's a really critical element. And I kind of view uh, drawing an ear as a nice kind of prep to drawing hands. Uh, you know, because of that, that practice it gives us. All right, so I want to come down here. There's this, there's this general ridge, this larger ridge that comes down and then curves, and it, they kind of fold together and along here. So I'm just going to use some circular marks here to build up value. Again, utilizing the side of the, the pencil. I'm kind of, I still have enough of a sharp point, but I kind of lost it a bit. Um, and I'm not too worried about these values equalizing. I might come back to that background a little bit. So again, just light circular marks with the graphite on its side to help build up tone. And I can, there's a highlight that comes down to here that I'm going to race out a little bit later. But these are all really soft transitions in here. One of the things you want to be careful with is overstating some of these areas. And so, you know, you want to be careful not to create a hard line down here. We see a, that dark path, but we want it to be... Um, a suggestion of a shadow, not a hard line. And I'm going to come back in and I need to, I need to be careful of 
I need to be mindful of the, the direction of my marks. So as I'm making these marks, I'm trying to think about the cross contour. Um, if you haven't heard that term, the, the contour is this. It's the outer edge of an object. Uh, it's the it's utilizing a line to define a three dimension the edge of a three dimensional object. The cross contour are uh, is are the marks within that form that help to reinforce its three dimensional quality. So I want to start to think through that and really understand what's happening. So we see this kind of ridge along here. It dips in. It's it's concave here. It comes back out and then back down and in underneath here. And so wherever I can, I want to use marks that help to reinforce that. Let me soften this out a little bit. All right, Karen is saying that it's, they've been wonderful confidence builders. I am really glad to hear that. You know, confidence is, a, is an interesting thing, and it plays a, an interesting role in drawing. Um, and one of the things that I, you know, I've said before is that, you know, marks are thoughts. They're, these are, every mark that we're making on here is some sort of visual representation of a thought that we've had. I like to think of the arm in, in the whole visual drawing, the visual and drawing process, kind of like a seismograph. Um, in the idea that we're, you know, we're taking in information through our eyes and we're processing it in our brain and it's coming out our arm almost like it's a seismograph needle just kind of following along with what's happening in here. We often put so much emphasis on what's happening in the hand um, and we, we think that you know, it's something that, that we're, our, it's, it's having to do with hand-eye coordination and it does to some degree, but I would argue that you know, if you're able to write write words, these small details, the, you know, these fine marks that, that accumulate to together to create words on the page, I think you have sufficient hand-eye coordination to get going. And then as you shift your focus onto um, of really observing and understanding what you're observing and what's happening up in your mind, then the, the, you continue to build hand-eye coordination from that. Um, if you, you, if you really feel like you need to develop more hand-eye coordination, um, then take some exercise, you know, take some time to do some exercises. You know, just like if you're a singer, you know, you would want to, you know, just vocalize and exercise your, uh, your, your larynx, your breathing, and, you know, kind of keep those skills sharp. You can do that with basic mark making, practice making circles and ovals, lines, all sorts of things just to build up the hand-eye hand coordination. Um, but I would argue that you're going to do that fairly naturally if you just draw. And as you build up that confidence, um, it's going to show in your work. So here there's a highlight here in that, in that concave bowl underneath this, this ridge. And I'm, gonna, I'm not even going to address that at this point. I can pull that out with an eraser, but I, what's going to be more helpful to me is to understand that that part's in shadow and, and is kind of catching some reflected light in there. So now I'm, as I'm come down, coming down here, we have this wonderful transition along in here where the, the shadows become sharper and more defined in some areas, more subtle and soft in others. And... Um, and that's going to be really kind of fun to, um, as we get to the, the final layers, to use my eraser to pull that back out. So here we have this nice alternation between dark in here against a little bit lighter. I'm making this a little bit darker against this highlight here. And then we shift back into dark against light. So that alternating sequence between light and dark is really, really interesting. And now I know I'm going to be um, you know, pulling out those highlights a little bit more uh, later. So this is, I want to be careful now, what I feel like I'm doing is I'm losing track of the, the, the general path of these forms. So I want to be careful um, so there's this angle to the ear, and as I got to this part, my instinct it feels like this mark along in here is tilted outward but it's not, it's actually, I'm kind of lining this up, it's actually in, slanting inward like this just a little bit. Um, so I, I need to kind of double check that. Uh, 
and it gets it gets dark in here. I'm gonna there's this dark spot here. I want to just check in relationship to everything else. I kind of kind of I don't think I hit that curve quite right. Um, so as as I'm as as I'm comparing these two kind of landmarks here, I realize that this is off a bit, and I can and I think I need to come down and out a little a little bit more. I need to exaggerate this curve. Um, now you know this is you know I, that didn't make a huge impact in in terms of our ability to understand that we're drawing an ear. So you want to ask yourself how critical correct proportions are in uh, at each stage of this drawing process. I felt that it, for me it was it was a bit critical because I'm using this curve as a landmark, and so I want to make sure that I'm getting that right because if that's off and I'm using that to evaluate the form and the placement of other aspects in the ear, then um, it has a it has a potential to throw me off in other areas. Kind of squinting. Um, this is a really an interesting reference photo that I've got here, because as I as I stare at it, I start to lose the overall shadow structure of the ear. But as I squint, I can start to see it more clearly. I can see uh, this shadow shape in here. And as you create that shadow shape, I'm just going like this to help visualize the path and then I want to build that value using directional marks that that end there rather than drawing a line that fills in so again squinting kind of gradually building up values and here what I actually want to do is I think I want to run these marks diagonally to contrast against this diagonal mark here, and that'll help to pop this edge forward a bit more. Okay. Um, I feel like this is a bit too harsh right here, so I'm just gonna try to feather this out a little bit. I'm just using the weight of the pencil here. And as I come up here, I want to really observe, and in my mind, I'm thinking we have this, this ridge here. It sinks into this the valley, comes up with as a ridge, and then can, there's a bit of a gentle slope, but it, it curls under here um, and then back up into this section. So we have this form like that. Um, so I want to try to visualize. I don't know what I was just doing there. Let's see. Kind of lost track where I was on the ear. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ignore the highlights at this point. Let me wash that all in, smooth it out. I'm going to come back into this a little bit later and pull out some of those highlights. Some of these forms are a little bit, a little bit hard. Everybody's doing all right during this time with social distancing and whatnot. Um, perfect time to art. And so much of drawing is, is, a, is tied to our, our focus and allowing yourself just to get sucked into the drawing. And a lot of that is, is, is just trying to shut down other parts of the mind. But I think the more you try to, the, the harder it actually gets. And so it's more about allowing yourself to get pulled into your drawing. And it can be a rather hypnotic process. So, um, I'm going to darken this a little bit more. Kind of creating a subtle transition in value as we go across. So we have dark, it gets a little bit lighter in here so I can make that ear a little bit darker and we shift back into dark. I'm really not bearing down very hard 
on the pencil. But if you need to, by holding your pencil at the very end, it's about kind of leaning into it to apply more pressure. Um, it's just like I'm, I'm just kind of gradually pushing down my hand, hands and that puts a little bit more pressure, but I'm still u utilizing the side of the um, graphite rather than the point. All right, so now I feel like I can start to become a bit more specific. Again, I'm not even, I'm not really pulling out the highlights a whole lot, but I think I'm gonna switch back to the, the carbon pencil and define this form. And I think what I wanna do is change the direction of my marks. I kind of, I, I can visualize the edge now of that. I wanna run these marks kind of vertically to contrast against this angle here. That'll help to create some separation there. I can also look at the cross contour here as I start to give this form. Rather than creating a line here, I'm gonna to try to visualize the path and then create it using a sequence, uh, a series of these kind of diagonal marks that go, that kind of wrap around the form there. I visualize this bump in here. And this, this really kind of forms this bowl in here. So I'm gonna to try to visualize that and maybe run these marks kind of diagonal to contrast against the diagonal and I'm coming kind of coming down into the ear on this side, coming up out of the ear in here. So I'm changing the angles here, and that'll, even if it's subtle, it'll suggest the form. And there's a bit of a rocking motion to the, my, my marks here, uh, so that I'm applying more weight towards the center of each mark and letting it kind of feather off. And I'm kind of losing focus a little bit. I'm gonna to switch to the side. And as I come down in here, we start to get a more distinct crease that I can, I can I kind of exaggerate a little bit. So as I come up out of the crease, I'm running my marks in one direction. As I go into it, I can change that direction and that helps to suggest the form a bit more. Uh, how do the carbon pencils in the graphite work differently? That's a good question. Uh, there is a slight different, slightly different feel to, to the um, carbon pencil. I'm still getting used to it. I haven't really utilized it a whole lot, but they seem to be working. I, I, one of the things that I think I've done is I've built up too much graphite on the lower layer. And so it's having a hard time accepting the carbon pencil onto the paper. Um, I'm kind of just... I've, that's the, the, the challenge with working with graphite is, such a, is, that it, is that it's such a hard material, it tends to burnish the paper and we lose some of that tooth. Um, and I feel like I've, I've, I've done that in, to some degree here, that, so I just want to be kind of careful with that. But otherwise, it works pretty well. It's just a bit more permanent of a mark. Um, So right in here, I can feel it slipping on that graphite as I'm applying a bit more pressure. It's just kind of slipping across there. Um, so if you if you're finding if you're working with carbon, a carbon pencil and you're finding uh, that it, that's happening, one of the things you can do is use an eraser to to kind of erase off that layer of graphite and then go back on with the uh, carbon pencil. Uh, so as I come around here, I'm thinking about this about this path. I'm not worried about it being too sharp of an edge because I, I want, it, there's a rounded quality here. So you want to be careful not to overstate that edge. But at the same time, it is sharper in some areas than others. Um, and then with that shadow comes through here. And then this thing. Want to then change the direction of my marks. And 
And I think when I when I use my eraser to pull out those highlights, this is all going to really pop. I can I can sense that my um, that I'm calibrating to the whites. Like as I'm looking at the values here, I'm interpreting this as white when it's actually quite gray right now, and that's throwing things off a little bit. But I think it's going to only work to my advantage as I erase out those highlights. Um, I think it's those are highlights are going to really pop. Okay, so now I want to think about the direction of the marks here, up to that edge. So as I'm, as I'm going along here, I'm keeping these marks really light. It's more about visualizing the path and then building up to that edge rather than drawing that line. And there's a, there's a specific shape to this shadow. It's a little bit darker down in here, a little bit lighter and then darker again. It kind of creates almost this kidney shape. As I come down here, as, as, you're, as you're going along, uh, I'm finding myself being really sucked into this area and losing sense of the context. You've got to force yourself to always be thinking about not only what does this look like, but where is it in relationship to everything else, and double checking, am I in the right spot before I even work with that shape? Um, and that's part of what I could, I could feel myself losing that, and I'm trying to intentionally bring that back into focus. Uh, maybe change the direction here. And if you're not sure what direction to make your marks, just shift to the circular mark to build up value. Why do I not stick to the graphite pencil? So I could stick to the graphite pencil, um, but I am choosing to go to the carbon uh, because it's a little bit richer in value, um, and it's actually it's showing up on uh, camera a little bit better. I think that that's my concern at this point. Um, if I wasn't being filmed right now, I would probably actually stick to the graphite, and I feel like I would probably understand the ear just as effectively. Um, but that's kind of one of the, the main reasons at this point. Um, but I'm, I'm enjoying the, the carbon pencil. So this form right here, this bump, I have the, I had a feeling like it's coming in like this, but it actually isn't. It creates basically a straight line down from this dark point here. And then, then it cuts over. And Jackie's saying, your biggest problem is drawing rocks, drawing or painting rocks. Sometimes they end up looking like a loaf of bread. That's an interesting thing. Um, yeah, rocks are tricky. Um, yeah, I think that the, the one suggestion, if, if you are, this is for Jackie, um, force yourself to try to break up the form of the rock, but into short, straight segments, kind of like what we, had, we attacked the ear early on. Instead of thinking about a curve this way, it's about think, breaking up into these short angular sections and then finding the curve within that. That might help break that a little bit. Um, and then what I what I found when, when working with rocks is to really understand three main values. The base, kind of middle value, um, the shadow, actually, I'm sorry, four main values. So you have like the base value, you have a shadow side and a highlight, and then a deep shadow in another part of that. If you can find four values in that, that can help to create that form and try not to over blend those forms that can sometimes happen as well as we we over blend the transition now and drawing the ear these transitions are rather soft and, and smooth but um, just try to try to see those forms uh, as as those four distinct values and um, and try not to blend them All right, I'm working on up here. This is this is a bit kind of more abstract, so I want to start to really make sure I understand the form. One of the things we've talked about before is that a lot of drawing is is about shifting your mindset back and forth between understanding the form 
as a sequence of abstract shapes. So thinking of yourself, I'm not, I'm not drawing this part of the ear, I'm just looking at this dark mark that moves in this direction. And it's you know, lighter in value than some other areas, but it's darker than the highlight. Um, and so trying to think about it just like that versus then shifting to really understand what's happening anatomically. You know, what am I looking at? What, what direction does it move? Does it, does it fold? Does it come forward? Does it recede? And so you want to practice kind of shifting back and forth between those two ways of thinking. This is really kind of an abstract shadow shape here. Squinting helps to prioritize values. You're going to see the shape of the light and dark a bit more effectively when you do. So if you're not squinting, give it a shot. Let me see here. I'm just using the screen as a reference. Feeling pretty good. I feel like this needs to be a little bit softer, this transition. So I just want to feather that out a little bit using these circular marks. Smooth that out. All right. And then uh, I want to come back in here and you can see the ear gets a little bit darker as it rounds around the lobe. So I'm kind of lightly doing the, the, the line. And as I'm doing that, I'm utilizing the side of the, of the pencil um, and almost like I'm pushing up into it to find that edge. Um, and and, and usually, again, kind of angling the pencil this way so it creates a kind of a gradation inward leading up to that edge. And then there's a bit of a bit of a shape to this form here. Let's see, and I can use a line to help sharpen that up. All right, come around here. So now as I as I come up the side of the ear, I'm going to then reverse my thinking, start working negatively by kind of drawing in this background here. And then hopefully that, that contrast in the way I'm working, we're um, darkening the background here, darkening the ear or down here as we travel up that edge is hopefully will add to the, the three-dimensional quality, create that illusion of depth a bit more effectively. All right, I'm glad you're understanding the forms a bit. So. Um, if there's anything that I'm not quite explaining effectively, just feel free to shout out. Ugh. So I'm feeling like this, you can, this, you can feel this ridge along in here, and I feel like that's distracting because it's, because it's uh, kind of paralleling the side of the ear. So I want to start to break that up a bit. So I'm going to use these circular marks to fill in that space between the ear and that dark edge. And this is where, I, yeah, that, this carbon pencil is really slipping on that layer of of uh, graphite. So I'm going to have to play with this a little bit, but hopefully that knocks that down a little bit. How's that working? I feel like that's working a little bit better. All right. All right. Now I think I'm at the point where I can start to pull out some of the highlights here. The bird in the background. Oh, can you hear the birds outside? <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, they're pretty loud today. Um, all right. So now what I want to do is I'm looking at, I'm kind of blurring my vision for some of the highlights. I'm trying to understand that pattern. So right in, in here, it's a bit of a highlight and I'm going to be pulling that out in the center of that form um, rather than right up against that edge because I, I don't want to flatten that out. This is, this is a three-dimensional form here. So I'm kind of dragging and pulling out from that central line to feather that out. And then from that center line, I'm pushing and lifting on the inside. 
And there's a bit of a highlight here. So just using my kneaded eraser, uh, and you're always, always drawing. I notice some students have, they, they shift their thinking when they're erasing, and, and for them erasing becomes kind of about correcting. Um, but in this case, it's really about a, uh, just about utilizing a different tool to achieve the values that we're going for. All right, so. There's kind of a high point in here, highlight. So pushing and lifting. So just trying to blend a little bit with the eraser itself. So it's starting to pick up graphite on, right on this edge, which is fine. So I'm not, not needing it at this point um, because I actually kind of like what's happening. It's smudging the, the graphite a bit more. So it's very, a very subtle pressure on it. And now I've got enough charcoal on my hands that I can utilize them as, as drawing implements. So I, I see a highlight in here um, but it's not as bright as the highlight here. So I want to be really careful not to overstate it. And if anything, I want to subdue that uh, uh, artificially, you know, make it more subtle than what I'm seeing in the reference photo. Just kind of gently tapping with that. All right, as I come across, I'm going to leave this. This is feeling pretty good. But I come into this, this light where the, the light is catching right around this ridge. And, and again, the highlight is set in from the edge a bit, not right up against it, and that helps to round that out. So there's this kind of lifting and then smoothing with my grubby hands here. And there's some texture in here that I can utilize to my advantage here. So as I I'm kind of I've erased this down to this kind of ridge, so it's almost this kind of wide paddle that can start to pull out that highlight. And I always want to be thinking about that form. These circular marks help to soften the, the kneaded eraser a bit. I'm going to go into the, we go into this valley here where there's a bit of a highlight. I'm kind of scooping it with my eraser right now. And as I come across, it's a little bit sharper right in this area here. This is all in shadow. And then where's the highlight here? All right, and then I'm gonna come back down in here and there's a highlight here. And I want, again, this is one where I really wanna be careful about going up to that edge because you can see as we transition over here, it starts to get lost. Um, this, this actually, this part reminds me a lot of painting. I'm almost thinking about this as kneaded eraser as, it, as though it's a brush. And we have a bit of a highlight here. All right, thank you everybody. Getting some good comments. I'm glad, Jackie, that the suggestion of the rocks makes sense. Um, I know there are some, uh, some videos on painting rocks in um, at, at Artist Network, in the Artist Network TV, we have videos dedicated to that subject. And we just filmed with a video with Johannes Vlauthaus that it, in watercolor, he showed a technique for uh, painting rocks in there. His uh, big painting small palette. So he uses a limited palette in watercolor, but
but he, he has this really special technique of using a card, a credit card, to, to create rocks. All right, softening that. I need a little bit more variation in here. Just kind of scooping this highlight out in here. Uh, right in here, there's a bit of a highlight. I just love kneaded erasers. Um, they create such varied marks because you can shape them however you want. I think I can pull out some heat. Suggestions of hair here. And I feel like I need to I need to pull this is such a visible landmark. I feel like I've understated it too much. So let me pull that back out a little bit. Um back with a carbon pencil and refine a little bit more so I can get some darker areas like right in here. Get the reference photo in front of me. I feel like what's projected on the screen is a bit more effective in terms of these value relationships. And be careful along here if you're if you're reestablishing this edge, it's not a hard and sharp edge. There's a bit of a rounded quality, and you don't want to you don't want to lose that. If I if I if I make it too sharp, it's going to flatten that form out. That's awesome that the uh, the birds are picking up outside. I don't know what's out there. We finally get some nice spring weather here. We it's been weird here. I'm in Colorado. Um, we've had some really beautiful warm days, and then we just got hit with about a foot of snow the other day. It's been kind of a crazy one, but today it's a bit warmer. All right. So now I'm just kind of picking along, pulling out some areas where I feel like I could darken it a bit more, I'm trying to keep my eyes blurred. If you're following along, this is a good time to set your, your drawing up at a distance from across the room and check it out, see how it holds up. Um, you want to change, con continually change the context of your work. And what I mean by that is, you know, I've been working with this drawing in this context, this arrangement. I'm in the same relative distance. It's the same orientation to me. I've been working in this way the entire drawing. Um, by changing the context, you can... Uh, you either set it up across the room, flip it upside down, hold it in front of a mirror, do things like that to change the relationship between you and the drawing. And doing so will often help you to see things that we we overcome. It's we have we develop a blindness to our work as we follow along. So you, that's why we we develop these um, tricks to help us to see the work more objectively. Uh, because it, you know, it's kind of like what happens when you open up, you go to the refrigerator and you're looking for the ketchup, you open up the, the refrigerator and you can't find it anywhere. You close it, you come back 20 minutes later and there it is on that shelf right in front of you. Um, it, that happens, that type of blindness happens when we draw and changing up the context can be really helpful. And so one of the things that helps me right now is that I can see on the screen in front of me the drawing itself as well as the reference image next to it. So this helps me to change that context because it's now it's much smaller. It's the equivalent of stepping away from it. Um, so I want to, I think I want to bring this forward a bit, pop that. And I think I might kind of artificially kind of enhance the value contrast in here to help pull the, um, those highlights out. Trying to keep these marks subtle. So if you're new to the series, I do this every Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern. Um, we're with Artist Network. My name's Scott. Um, it, you can find more information and more drawing resources on Artist Network. There's a page for Drawing Together. That's the name of the series. Um, and there's, so there's just more free drawing resources there. Uh, we also check out Artist Network TV, a lot of videos there. 
Um, if you're needing some inspiration, techniques, um, watercolor oil, acrylic, pastel, you name it, there's a lot of videos there. And there's a dog out there barking. Seems to having, be having a good time. Um, now, if, if this drawing was all about value, I chose ultimately the wrong medium. One of the things we talked about in the last drawing as we worked with the pairs is really um, understanding what your medium brings to the work of art and then utilizing that, respecting that, and extracting as much power from that as you can. And so what I mean by that is that uh, graphite lends itself to this uh, the silvery quality. It's not about creating a dynamic range in contrast the way charcoal lends itself. Um, and it, its strength is in being able to create fine detail, again, building up a kind of an atmosphere of silvery light. Um, and this carbon pencil um, it kind of is a kind of a bridge between those two. Um, if, you, if you're looking at this or if you're working with it and you, and you really are drawn to that strong contrast between the dark here and the light of the ear, then uh, you, maybe you want to do this in charcoal where you can get these rich darks and create that strong contrast. Uh, to me, I, th I feel like I'm really responding to these subtle shifts and turns in the, in the value here um, that the, the graphite and the, the carbon pencil kind of lend itself to. So um, And it's kind of like, you know, with, with watercolor, it's all about um, the, the, the beautiful color that you can achieve through the translucency and the transparency of the material. It's got a different quality than, say, oil paint. And you utilize, utilize it for its strengths. Don't try to make it do something that it's not intended to do. I mean, you can... Everybody utilizes their, their materials in a different way. When I work with watercolor, I'm traditionally more of an oil painter, so I, I tend to work with the watercolor in more of an oil painting way, uh, just out of habit, and you're gonna find your own way of utilizing the materials. But just consider what are the strengths of the material and are you really utilizing it for its strengths or are you trying to force it in, into something else? Um, let's see, I feel like I wanna, maybe I wanna bring the line out a little bit more. So here, the, there's kind of this lost and found line as we go along this edge. How does that work? I like the way that pops. How do you keep from overworking a portrait? It's a good question. Um, it, it, I'm a little, actually, a little bit hesitant to suggest to not overwork it. Um, it's really helpful at some point actually to, to know where that boundary is. Like, so if you've overworked a drawing, it sounds like you you've have that experience, you know what too much is. Um, the hard part is knowing what too little is. Um, and, and we have a tendency to kind of second guess that and be less confident in that saying like, you know, we, whatever's happening on there isn't quite reading enough. It's not enough. I need to do more. I need to do more. Next thing you know, then it's gone too far. Um, and so the, the, some of the, the, the things that you can do to help rein that back in is to force yourself, you know, limit the number of marks, for example. I, you know, I've assigned um, paintings where we, I, I give students a limited number of marks. You've got 50 marks that you can make on the page or 20 marks, and that's all you've got. And, and that's a helpful way of... Um, kind of confronting that issue is that you you can't really overwork it. It's about a, about a, utilizing the materials in such a way that you're getting as much information out of as few marks as possible. Um, so that some, doing something like that, creating an artificial constraint can help you to see that and develop confidence that um, that uh, you know the, what you're actually doing on there is sufficient to convey the information you need, that it's reading as the person effectively. Um, you know, or artificially just saying, look, I'm, I'm just going to stop now. It, I don't, it doesn't feel done, but I'm going to stop. I'm going to set it aside, come back to it a day, a week later, and then see how it reads. Um, sometimes we just get caught up in the process itself and, 
and we become less objective. Um, and in general, the criteria that I use is, you know, am I, am I just kind of picking? So right now I'm essentially kind of picking. I should just stop right now because the marks that I'm making right now aren't really adding to my understanding of what's in front of me. I feel like I could stop right now and say, like, I've, I've really expressed everything about the structure of this ear that I need to. Um, so the rest is just kind of polishing and finishing it. Uh, and, and that's where we can tend to, we tend to overwork it. Um, and so, you know, I'm kind of doing that now because I'm utilizing this process at this time to continue the dialogue because I like chatting with everybody. Um, and it's helpful to have something to do there. But if you find that your marks no longer are really meaning anything, if they're not really suggesting something is just about picking, this is that's the point at least for me where I where I put it down and say I need to I need to stop because I'm going to start um, I'm going to start doing something I'm going to start overworking it. So a lot of it comes down to just really being aware of efficiency. If that makes sense. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, Johannes' classes are excellent. So if you haven't checked them out, if you do go to artistnetwork.com, check out the paint along series that Johannes has done. He's been doing this for years. Uh, been just doing essentially what we're doing here, but with, with painting. Uh, so he does these series where you have uh, oil painting, watercolor, and pastel all in one, uh, one paint along series. And they're really excellent. Um, do you see, do you use a fixative spray? Um, Fixatives are good um, when you're when you're when you're ready for them. Be careful because they do have a tendency to adjust the contrast. I don't generally fix my drawings; they don't really do anything with them. They just sit in a pile. Right? And you know, it's real for me. Drawing is about drawing the act of drawing rather than the drawing and making this an object that I'm going to hang up on the wall. But for you know, each of you, you're going to have your own relationship with with the object. And so if you do have something that you want to preserve, I would spray fix it. And then if you're, if you're not displaying it, if you're, um, you know, if it's going to be stored in a flat file or something, you might consider uh, kind of a mylar sheet that lays in on top of it to help prevent it from smudging as well. That's helpful with pastel work and other things that are a bit more fugitive in that area. Do your eyes bounce between darks and lights easily, or do you focus on one of them or the other? Uh, so PMT, that was a great question about focusing on the balance between lights and dark. So it's, it's kind of all of the above when you're, when you're evaluating the, the contrast between lights and darks. Uh, and so much of drawing is about looking in one area, but putting your attention on another. So if I'm looking at, say, the highlight along here, I'm holding in my mind other values here. I'm always aware of what's happening, happening in the periphery. Um, and that's where uh, squinting and blurring your vision becomes helpful because it eliminates all the detail and you start to see the whole of the structure. And then when you bring your eyes into focus, then you can see the specific form and the detail. So if I'm looking at the value here, I am studying this value, but I'm also aware of the values along in here. Uh, and, and sometimes it's a matter of uh, kind of looking in a central area and but putting your awareness on uh, what's happening around it. Uh, and I've, I believe I read somewhere that our, our eyes are actually more sensitive to value structure or value relationships just outside your center of vision, especially when the light is low. Um, those, that's when the, you, you have light receptive cells in your, in your retina, you have rods and cones. The rods become more active in low light situations and they become more sensitive to value relationships. Um, and they're actually more sensitive right outside the center of your, your center of focus. And so if I'm trying to evaluate, say, this area here, I might actually put my, uh, this, my center of vision right here, but put my attention on the value right outside of it. Um, and you might test this, actually. I, I find it effective on a, if, when the moon is out at night. I can, you can actually see the moon a bit more clearly more, with more definition if you put your, your center of vision just off to the left or right. Um, and that tends to be what happens with uh, drawing as well. So just kind of offsetting your vision a little bit. So hopefully that makes sense. 
Um, you're welcome, memory. How do you keep from overworking a portrait? We got to that. What paper am I using? I'm using this. Uh, this is a Hanamula paper, the Skitza 190. So it's a pretty heavy paper. It's a 90 pound paper. Um, so this, it's, yeah, nice and smooth. Um, I also, uh, in some of the other, um, in some of the other uh, videos that I've got, I've been working with a rag paper, also by Hanamula. Um, I enjoy it quite a bit. It seems to be lifting off uh, the, the charcoal well. So one of the things that, or not charcoal, the, uh, the carbon pencil well, uh, one of the things that you want to be aware of as you're experimenting with different papers is really understanding how you, how you utilize the material and how it's responding to the paper. You know, is it accepting it? Is it just kind of slipping off? Is it erasing back out? Is, you know, sometimes some papers will really hold the graphite or the charcoal, and when you, no matter how much you erase, it just doesn't go anywhere. Uh, and and, and it's, it, it's really kind of particular to you, so I would encourage you to experiment and make sure that you really understand that the drawing is about the relationship between the marks, that, you know, the, the material that you're using, a graphite, charcoal, um, carbon pencil, whatever, it's, but it's a relationship between that and the surface that, that it's on. So the paper is half of the drawing right there. Um, and we often forget that we'll, we'll spend so much time focusing on utilizing the right pencils or the right charcoal and then just grab whatever paper is around. Um, but each paper that you use is going to uh, be uh, different. It's going to respond to the materials in a different way and they're, they're engineered really um, to work with uh, the different materials. So hopefully that makes sense. So again, I'm just kind of picking around, uh, looking at some of the other questions. Do watercolor with rocks instructions? So Susan asks a question about if I have a, a instruction on watercolor and rocks. I personally do not, um, but check out, um, go to artistnetwork.com and check out um, a video called uh, Big Painting Small Palette. It's a very, it's a new one that we filmed with Johannes, um, and he, in that, um, he shows his technique for working with rocks in watercolor. Um, how do you spray it or make it so it won't erase later? So when, you, when you're looking at a fixative, um, there is a workable fixative, and then there's kind of more permanent fixative that you can have. Uh, you now, a workable fixative is a bit more workable um, but I think if you intend to continue to work on your drawing, or even if you think you might, don't spray it. Um, even with a workable fixative, I think it's going to cause more trouble than you might want. Um, and when you do it, just be kind of gentle. I would do a few different coats of it. Um, read the instructions. I think it's probably 8 to 10 inches at least away. Um, especially early on when I would spray fix my drawings, I had a tendency to... I would just get too close to it, and then it would really saturate the paper and mess with it. It's really just a, a sheet of um, this the, that spray fix that um, sits on the surface. So you want to just kind of be gentle with it. Um, do a few coats, put it aside, um, make sure it's well ventilated. That stuff's not good for you to breathe in, um, but uh, that helps to helps to preserve it. Um, but then, yeah, you get like a sheet of mylar or something to protect it when you're done. Uh, that's going to do. Um, a really good job, especially if you're working in a sketchbook and it's opening and closing, it's going to smudge all over the place. See if you can um, isolate it with a sheet of mylar. Um, so I think I'm seeing halo as I step away. How do you avoid that again? All right, so if you've got a halo, so say working on the, the outer edge, um, and what I had earlier is that as I was making these marks here, it was creating this dark ridge that paralleled the ear. So then you come back in the space between them, and I was working with a heavier kind of circular mark building up to that and then feathering it out this way. Um, and sometimes it, it, you, you can't really avoid it. Um, if you need to, kind of use the palm of your hand to smooth it out. That helps. Um, I'm starting to see some kind of blotchiness in areas as well. Um, and then uh, also if, you're, if your halo is right up against that edge, um, try to bring your marks right over it and then use your eraser to cut it back out. So if, I, if I'm going like this, I can bring my marks right over the edge. Then I can use my eraser to kind of cut that form back out. And that helps to get rid of that halo. Now, of course, I've got a halo in this 
on the inside. So what I want to do is kind of soften that a little bit. So now I've got a highlight in an area where I don't need it, but I can kind of rework this. Ah, I got that, that line right there. Um, so now since this is dark, as I want to build up this value, I can go like, I can just wash right over that edge. And, you know, it's not doing anything to that dark side because it's so much darker. But I'm just kind of taking down that tone that I just erased out with the... Uh, with the eraser. So hopefully that makes sense. It's kind of like layering it. So if that value, if that, that, uh, that halo is right up against the dark edge, just bring your marks right over, erase it down, and then build up your values again. All right, James, welcome. I'm glad to see you here. But so we've been going on for, what are we at right now? Whoa, almost two and a half hours. Or, I mean, an hour and a half. It's been, it's 2.30 my time. So uh, about an hour and a half. This goes up as a recording afterwards. Um, come back, check out, check us out on Wednesday, same time, so 3 p.m. Eastern. We are doing Orange You Excited. I think I'm going to work in charcoal on that one. We've done a couple now with graphite. I'm going to switch back to charcoal. Uh, I think for that, for that one, we'll see. See how I feel that day. Um, but I've really enjoyed our time here. If you have any questions, just let me know. There's about a 30 second delay here. So what I'm gonna do is just gonna let it, let it record for a bit before I turn it off because what's happened in the past is I'll, I'll sign off and I'll get this, uh, not a flood, but I'll get a handful of questions uh, that, that I wanna get back an answer and I can't because I've stopped the stream. So I'm just gonna let it go. I really wanna thank you all for joining me today. It's been a, a lot of fun. Um, hopefully the ear is a little less weird now. It's kind of, an, again, it's a kind of a strange form when you think about it, but. Uh, a fun one. I think it's a really great tool to help build your portrait skills um, and just drawing skills in general. So thank you for joining me. Oh, FC, question about why do I not use a black and white reference photo? That is a really good question. So you could do that. Um, and I think that is certainly going to get you farther along in your drawing. Um, for me, one of the main challenges is trying to interpret color as value. Um, and and I, I think, you know, if, if I weren't uh, doing this live in this format here, I would hopefully have like a model in front of me and I would be drawing from their ear uh, specifically. Uh, I think drawing from life is really going to build your skills most effectively. Um, and then short of that, a photograph I think works. Um, and, and, and really, ultimately, you're going to, by working on a black and white photograph, you can develop your technique. You're going to end up with a, a, a nice um, end result. But I think th developing that skill of interpreting color as value is really helpful, especially when you start to get into really bright colors. Uh, I think we're, that's something that we're really going to confront on Wednesday with, with an orange because there's a strong light on it. Um, and that brightness of the orange is going to uh, be a challenge. We tend to interpret bright, highly saturated color as a lighter value than it actually is. Um, and so I, I believe that it's going to develop your drawing ability uh, more effectively if you work from, from life first. If you can't work from life, then work from a color photograph. Um, but, you know, there's definitely nothing wrong with working from a black and white photo. But that's, that's my thinking at least, so. All right. Uh, you are welcome, everybody. Let's see, looking for other questions. All right, Donna says, the ear is still weird, just less intimidating. That's exactly what I was hoping for. Victoria, do I work on tone paper? Yes, I do. Um, there's a few others in the series, um, the Drawing Together series, that you should see in the playlist on the Artist Network YouTube page uh, that I worked with a tone paper. I'm trying to think of what the subjects were. I did a, oh, lemons. Life gave us lemons. That was on toned paper. Um, I did a hat. Hats off to you, which was on black paper. Um, and then I did the pipe. Uh, I won't say the, the French title there, referencing Rene Magritte, but that was also done on tone paper. So I think there's a few there. So if you want to check those out, those were done with charcoal and chalk on toned paper. So.
All right. Thank you, everybody. Um, I appreciate it. I'm going to sign off. And I will see you all on Wednesday.